Hey everybody, it's the NFT Roundtable, a podcast produced by Umba Daima. I'm your host, Iris Nevins. It's Tuesday, July 12th, 2022, and I'm talking to today to Rick Lomas, CEO and co-founder of Super High, which is a platform for learning how to code. How are you doing today, Rick? Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's great to be on on the podcast. Yes, it's great to have you. We had a great little chat before we started. Yes. Um, so, you know, tell us a bit about your background, who you are and what you do. So I'm Rick. I'm the CEO and founder of Supai. Uh, my background is originally I started out in the creative industry in the UK. You might be also from the accent, not originally from the US, originally from Manchester in the UK. Um, worked at a lot of tech startups back in London, back in the day, and kind of found, found my way into education. So started working at General Assembly, was one of the first instructors at General Assembly in London, uh, kind of caught the education bug. Uh, basically loved, I was teaching all these people, basically helping them learn lots of new skills. Uh, so I actually left General Assembly to start a code school in London. So me in front of a whiteboard all day, kind of pointing at things and kind of explaining things in person. And over time, we were getting a lot of people basically trying to uh, learn from all around the world. So I kind of looked into, you know, how do we actually make this more scalable? So I actually left that code school, uh, started up Supai a few years ago, and basically tried to make this kind of uh, in-person classroom experience online. And that's kind of really what Supai started out. We really wanted to take this kind of like creative uh, classroom environment and basically make it online so that anyone anywhere in the world can learn. Awesome. That's amazing. And then you're on a podcast called NFT Roundtable. So what yes. does Super High <laughs> have to do with NFTs, Web3, blockchain, all that? So we have a courses on uh, Web3. We teach people how to code Web3 projects. And more recently, we started a project called Super High Basic Income, which was essentially a kind of open project. You know, we have scholarships as part of Supai where basically we had, you know, people take in uh, our courses for free and we wanted to basically make the best scholarship in the world. Like how could we go beyond just a scholarship of just giving away free content? So we actually looked into what our community needs. You know, we're very close with our community. We've chat with them all the time. And some of the biggest blockers that we found to people learning wasn't just learning itself. It was uh, money. It was basically paying rent. It was doing the things they wanted to do in their lives. And money is obviously a big factor in that. So we started Super Basic Income with the idea of we're going to give away some money and see what people do with it. Is money a blocker to actually uh, stopping people doing the things they want to do? So we did a project and essentially we said $1,000 a month for six months, you get a free laptop as part of that, you get education as part of that. And we wanna see what you do with that. If you do nothing at all, that's fine. You can basically take that money and do whatever you want with it. We're, we're not putting any kind of restrictions on that. We're not saying you need to kind of have some outcomes or goals as part of that. But if we're wrong and money isn't a big factor in stopping people what they want to what they want to do with their careers, then we know that at the end of this as well. So for us, it was basically trying to make the best scholarship in the world, and for the the end user, it was basically getting one thousand dollars a month. And the one thing that we wanted to do as part of that was basically not make it look like a scam because you know if we were giving away a thousand dollars a month, if you've never heard of Supai, you might be like this isn't real, how can we prove that this is actually a real thing? And that's kind of where we weaved Web3 into this. So one thing that we did is we put all the money into a crypto wallet. We basically proved that the money was there, ready to go, ready to deploy. We're sending the money every single month. We're proving that that isn't reliant on us. And this is something that we wanted to use uh, crypto for to basically kind of have that transparency and that kind of public access to show that we're actually doing the things that we say that we were doing. Amazing. And then where there's an NFT involved here, where does that come in? Yes. So originally we put $30,000 to this campaign. So we obviously, you know, $1,000 a month for six months times five, we wanted five people to be as part of that. And we opened it up to donations too. And again, using crypto, we could prove that those donations were going directly into this fund, you know, if we were using something like PayPal or Venmo, you know, we could have lied. Uh, we could have said, hey, we only took four, do four donations when in reality we took 400 donations and took that money for ourselves. So using crypto, we had this very transparent way to prove that this kind of money was going into the system. 
and basically people who donated got an NFT to actually prove that they were uh, donating to the system as well. So we wanted to use this idea of Web3, not only from a kind of way of saying it's just say art or you know this kind of transferable thing, but basically prove that people were actually donating to a project they support. Yeah, I love that. I love this use case of NFTs being one, yeah. a reward, but also a... A, a certificate of authenticity for an action yeah. that was taken to support a cause or to support someone else. I think that's really powerful. Exactly. We kind of wanted to have this campaign be, you know, we really wanted to lead with transparency. And that's something that we felt like because you're giving away money and basically there was no outcomes for that money. Again, people might feel like it, it doesn't really exist. You know, we see these things on on you know Instagram and Twitter where it's like retweet this or like this post, mm -hmm. you know, we'll give away a laptop. But a lot of those campaigns are not real. Like that that laptop never existed. It was just a way to actually just get social traffic, basically. And we didn't really want to feel like that was the case with this. We wanted to feel like this was something that's a lot more genuine and and real and something that impacts people's lives. And if people felt like that wasn't part of this campaign, you know, we wanted to have the tools that we could use to ensure that was true. Mm -hmm. And we looked around, we you know looked at all the things that you could possibly use on the internet to actually um, have that kind of transparent, decentralized uh, payment system. And crypto is where we landed, basically. It was something that we felt that like could be used in a slightly different way than most people are using it right now, which is mainly around transactional value, uh, but more transacting it to a more mainstream type campaign. Right. And and for the people that got the basic income, are they still in the yeah. pro are they still getting the income or is it finished? Um, we're at month five right now, I think it is. Um, so they're still getting it. And basically people that we, we're talking to who are getting this money, um, people are changing their lives with it. We've seen people, you know, go on and build uh, photograph schools in, in Mozambique. So there's a guy who is in Mozambique, that's one of the winners. He's now employing people in Mozambique to actually um, train up. So we, we've seen not only the people who won, the seven winners who won, but also the kind of side effects of that as well, which is like, it's actually having an impact beyond just those seven winners as well. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's kind of like an unintended consequence. Yeah, you know, we didn't know if people were just going to use this or not use this at all and or waste it potentially. And I think what we've kind of found from the end of it is the people who've who received this money are basically making big differences in their lives very quickly. Yeah. Who would have thought that giving people money would change their lives? Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm being I mean, facetious, it's... but it, it it's something that <laughs> is, uh, it's something that's just so obvious at this point. It, it's, it's kind of a shocker, the resistance to the idea, you yeah. know, the fact that even I think about of, of myself, for example, I have, yeah. Yeah. I have so much debt that even just being able to pay off that debt a little bit faster would have yeah. massive impacts on my life personally. And I'm not, and I'm someone that's, you know, relatively successful, right? So imagine yeah. for someone that is maybe, a, is not as further along as I am. Yeah, we we actually had 22,000 people apply for this wow. in just eight days. So it's a very successful campaign. And, you know, we didn't expect quite as many wow. people How to apply as we, we thought. How do you pick out of 22,000 people? So initially so we had this idea. Yeah, because we kind of planned for maybe about 1,000, 2,000 people to apply. And, you know, that was based on previous scholarships that we had. But... Obviously, when you throw money into the mix and people are a little bit more interested, um, we had 22,000 people apply. And basically, because we were using things like crypto wallets, we essentially made the whole system of judging decentralized as well. So essentially, what everyone's applications went into a kind of judging system where basically judges who were basically hand selected, those judges won, uh, those judges were paid to actually pick the winners. None of the Supai team actually like picked the winners themselves. It was actually done through kind of the community itself. So it was a kind of very community driven process. It was basically the community picking for other creatives who they feel like would win. And kind of back to your point, you know, we saw the kind of like the amount of um, the 
kind of common themes that were going through a lot of the the applications. They were a lot around like wanting to start their own business, wanting to go freelance, wanting to change jobs. And a lot of people just felt like they couldn't do that because they were hooked into the current job. They didn't have the funds to actually be able to, you know, spend the time and the, the kind of difference in money that they would lose to actually apply for work and, you know, go freelance or do the things they actually wanted to do. So for us, it was basically how do we kind of cover those, you know, basic needs, obviously basic incomes trying to cover not all of their funds, but basically some of them to give them that safety net, basically. Mm -hmm. So for us, we want to provide some kind of safety net to creative people to basically see if they actually do change their careers. Is it education alone? Is it money and education? Is it none of the above? Um, we kind of want to see what happened when uh, we added that into the mix. So take me back to the genesis of Super High. Like what, what inspired you to yeah. start this company? So I used to teach in the classroom and it being in the classroom space, you kind of have to make it expensive just because you're in a, you know, generally usually in a kind of like major city, usually in the center of a city in the classroom where people are going to come to you. And for me, that wasn't particularly accessible. So, you know, the price wasn't accessible because you have to make it thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to basically have a space with a teacher in there. Um, and, you know, people's lives don't really fit into being in a place in a certain time. So for me, it was kind of like, how do we provide really high quality education to people on a more accessible level? So they can fit it around their lives. They don't need to be in a major city to do it. You know, if I was teaching in London and you're in Atlanta, for instance, you know, you would never come to one of my lessons, but using the internet, you could be taught by me. And that was something that we wanted to actually kind of like provide was, how do we provide really, really good education in a very different way that doesn't feel like just YouTube videos or, you know, of kind of like workbook, but more kind of like together working very closely with, with the company itself. So we mentor a lot of people all around the world. You know, we're in 90 countries at the moment and we're basically changing people's lives through education as well. So we've seen people really kind of accelerate their careers in uh, ways they never kind of thought before. It's not just coding that we do, it's coding, design, project management. We have a range of different uh, uh, different courses that we actually provide and obviously Web3 now as well. So, you know, we've got a big range of um, how we're changing people's lives. We generally focus a lot more on uh, creative professionals. So people who work in uh, kind of creative fields already, people who get their hands dirty every day and like to make things is kind of like what we say. Um, and that's something that we're really focused on because what I've seen is if you try and teach a wider audience, say finance bros to artists, very different way of teaching. Yeah. So for us, we're focused on how do creatives actually learn the skills they need to learn to get better at their, their roles. That's so interesting. The idea of, of focusing these coding skills on creatives specifically, yeah. you know, I, when you mm. think about it, it's like, the process of learning how to code is very tedious. I, for my listeners that may not yeah. know this, I went through a coding boot camp as well. Um, that's how I made my transition into technology and becoming an engineer. And it's such a tedious process. There's so much repetition that you have to do of like practicing the same skills over and over and over and over again. Um, and learning how to do things and how to build things and learning by doing, which is a lot of what engine, uh, which is a lot of what artists do and creatives. And so yeah. I've never actually thought about this before, but it is, it is kind of like a perfect fit to, you know, a perfect yeah. transfer of skill sets from like learning how to paint digital artworks, you know, using, yeah. you know, these like using your iPad to like learning how to build a bot or a smart contract using code. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's similar to, you kind of mentioned art, like if you kind of have this, you know, if you're going to an art school, like a, tr a traditional art school, but you're really interested in say modern art rather than classical art, you know, the stuff when you learn classical art, you're like, I don't really want to do this. Like I, I get why we're trying to learn this, but that's not really what I want to do. So when I was teaching uh, in the past and teaching to a much wider audience, you know, I'd be teaching things that people didn't care about and they would kind of be in the class looking a bit bored. And for me, that was something that I don't want to make the people I teach bored because 
what's the point? Like that doesn't have a good outcome for me. doesn't have an, a good outcome for the students. So how do you focus it onto people's interests? So for me, it was kind of like, I saw the people that I knew that I was good at teaching, mainly creative uh, people who wanted to make things, who already had some background in that and laser focused on those people and said, you know, if I'm going to teach something that is repetitive, then I might as well make it interesting while we do that and show the different techniques in different ways than trying to be like, oh, you want to learn this classical art, but you're into modern art. So I think it's that teaching methodology, which is really important because, you know, think back to a really good teacher at school, you know, there's all these teachers you've probably forgotten because it wasn't really that interesting of a class. But when a teacher clicks with you, it's like you remember that teacher forever. And that's something that we've been trying to do at Supai, which is, how do we make something that's actually really interesting to the people that we focus on rather than trying to be as mainstream or wide as possible? Mm -hmm. I think if you go wide, it feels a bit more like, you know, it's not really for anyone at all. And you focus, it's for certain people and they feel like it's for them as well. So I think for us, it's trying to make it this experience that doesn't feel tedious and it doesn't feel like just repeating yourself. It feels this kind of like, oh, I'm learning new techniques every single day. Mm -hmm. I'm building up on top of the skills I actually want to I actually want to learn, basically. I love this. I'm, education has been a big theme lately, you know, yeah. because of a lot of the work that we do at my company. And, yeah. and also, uh, I'm a former educator as well before I became a teacher, before I yeah. became a, an engineer. And I just went to visit the Ron Clark Academy. Have you heard of it in Atlanta? I haven't known. It's this... It's this no. private school um, here in Atlanta. They have small classes. It's a middle school. So it's, I think it's like 90 to 100 kids total. Yeah. But they've basically, re they've designed the entire building so that it's almost like you're at Hogwarts. And so there's amazing oh, wow. artwork <laughs> all over the walls. There's slides. There's like door, there's like classrooms where you have to say something in a certain way for the wow. door to open and you enter into this like whole other world. I mean, it's so amazing. And I, I've learned about the school for, wow. I knew I learned about the school years ago when I was a teacher because they yeah. use a lot of, uh, they use a lot of art, dance and music in, in storytelling yeah. to teach the kids um, because yeah. of the, 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 essentially the area, the neighborhood that the school was in, that's what those kids really liked. That's what motivated them. And yeah. so they had to figure out how to use, or sorry, the, the, the person who created the school had to figure out how to use art, music, dance in order to teach kids that did not care about math and science, how, you know, yeah. how to learn math and science. And so it ended up blossoming into this whole school now that has been on wow. Oprah and like they've been to the White House and all this really cool stuff. But yeah, I think they're really, That's really crazy. being able to design curriculum around like an audience a specific audience yes. is just so 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 powerful so i'm i'm really happy to see that you're doing this kind of work yeah i used to work with a non-profit in the uk that was teaching um coding to kids and the kids were usually between like 9 and 11 and we'd go into schools and basically do after school clubs and there were some kids that you know were special needs they had adhd there's a kid with tourettes and people you know kids that just couldn't really sit still and when you kind of focused it onto like making something that they wanted to make, you know, in games, for instance, um, they would actually focus mm -hmm. on it. And I think it was just kind of the night and day difference between, you know, teaching math in the class, for instance, like that, that kid would not be interested. You do the same thing, but kind of orientated towards a game that they can make themselves and they are just laser focused. So it's, it's interesting to see like how you know even kids and adults kind of think in the same way it's like if you focus them onto the things that they're interested in and you know teach in a way that actually appeals to them um they don't even they might not even realize what they're being taught in, in yeah. a way then you know this kid thought he was just making a game but underneath it was learning to code it was learning physics it was learning math in there as well uh learning computer science skills as part of that too and, you know, in the end, it's like, he's still making the game, he's still having fun, but he's learning at the same time. So I don't know, I think there's a lot of kind of like focus. And, you know, the, the better you focus your kind of like attentions on trying to get those skills into people, then 
the, the more that people will respond to it and the more they'll kind of take it forwards, I feel. Yeah. Yeah. For anybody out there that's listening, that, that, that is, is trying to teach or, or is wanting to do something to teach. I think there's a lot, there's a lot to learn yeah. from, from people like yourself that have been able to um, really master the art of teaching, which again is like not about just like communicating information. It's about figuring out how to yeah. get that specific person and personality yeah. to consume and learn to consume the information and then understand and learn the skill sets. And it really the way that you do that changes from person to person and like any yeah. good teacher is able to figure out a way to, to help a person learn no matter what their background or their interests are. Yeah. And I think kind of just going back to, you know, the super basic income thing that we did, um, even for me, you know, I came into like crypto relatively late, probably like 2019, 2020. And for me, it was kind of like interesting to see from our student base, you know, our students aren't into web three, you know, most of them are just kind of like, plain old mainstream average people on the street yeah. but you know when you kind of can frame nfts or crypto in a way that actually makes sense to them um it's it is that kind of learning experience as well because you know i do see that kind of um a lot of nft projects do miss the kind of ideas of like why it's important as nfts versus say just digital art and i feel like a lot of the kind of decentralization isn't really framed in that kind of way that makes sense to a more mainstream audience at the moment. It feels very still technical. And, you know, I think there's this kind of big gap. There's 90% of people I'd say that don't care about crypto, don't care about Web3, don't care about NFTs. They maybe are passive on it. They're not like actively haters or actively pro it. But I think that story of like why everyone is in this space is kind of being missed because we're in the space, we know the benefits, we know why it's important to us, but I feel like that communication to a more mainstream audience hasn't really kicked in yet. Yeah. And, you know, we tried to do a little bit of that with Supai Basic Income and it did convert a few people who were like, I had no idea about crypto. I didn't understand the benefits of it. Um, I see why you're doing it now. And um, it was trying to frame it in a slightly different way that a lot of people hadn't seen before. So I think for me, it was kind of like a bit of a learning uh, even for me of like what works well to get a more mainstream approach to crypto or web three and you know what would actually make sense for an average person to be interested in this space and like what would sell them on this really so you know even for me it's like i'm constantly learning about this stuff and constantly trying to make um you know what we do better and you know appeal to as many people as possible so what do you see the future of super high as so we see Web3 being a kind of key component of what we do going forwards. Um, we're building out a lot of things right now to basically add the same kind of principles of you know, decentralization and um, you know, super basic income in there. The transparency is a big part of what we want to do. Um, you know, the decentralization and letting people have ownership of this platform, essentially trying to make the students run the school in a way. So, you know, we don't want it to feel like it's at this kind of like super high and students and it's very separate but we have a lot of people in our community at the moment who love what we do and want to get involved as well so you know, maybe the future is towards the DAO kind of model but you know i don't think we're quite there yet but we want to layer all these kind of like web3 um principles really into what we do you know it might not be using the exact crypto techniques right now but you know layering that kind of like transparency laying that kind of idea of decentralization and ownership as part of what we do as well and basically what would a art school or a creative school look like if it was built on crypto is kind of where we're trying to go okay very 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 interesting so what um what is a user experience on super high if someone is interested in learning how to code they go yep. to the website like what happens next so at the moment we have free and paid courses. So we have a, a free course, which is all about if you've never built a website before and don't know where to start, it's called Plan, Design, Code, Your First Website. Uh, it's a four hour course actually taught by me. Um, and basically it's a video based course. You can kind of dip in and out at any time. 
And if you're interested in kind of learning more technical skills or more deeper skills, uh, we have paid courses and a subscription as well, um, where you can learn on 26 different courses at the moment across different ranges of skills. Um, we have a big community of people uh, across the world which help each other out as well. I'm in there, uh, all of our staff are in there helping each other out. And uh, yeah, we have this really strong learning environment that isn't just like, you know, you're learning on your own. This is something that is a group activity. If you have questions, you can ask and we will help you out. Um, but our goal is to basically help people where they, to get to where they want to do, go in their careers, basically. So um, that kind of like learning experience is basically uh, an accessible way to get high quality education and that kind of interaction with real people to ask questions to as well. Yeah, so that's really amazing that you have the, the multiple options that people can choose on the website for yeah. Super High. I love that. And so, you know, for anyone that is interested in learning how to code, I feel like I hear people all the time in the Web3 space saying, I want to learn how to write a smart contract. I want to learn how to write a smart contract, but you have to learn how to code to then learn how to write the smart contract, right? And so I think sometimes yeah. people get intimidated by that initial first step. So if someone wants to learn how to code and they're just getting started, what are your top tips that you would recommend? So if it's learning to code, I'll actually give the top tips for making smart contracts first. Okay. Um, trying to make it a little bit wider because you don't necessarily need to learn to code to get a smart contract going. Uh, there's great tools out there at the moment, such as Manifold, that let you just make a smart contract for free. Um, the, what, the, the reason why you'd want to make your own smart contract is you'd want to make it custom to the things that you're doing. So kind of similar to like how Squarespace lets you build a website. You don't need to learn to code to get a website online. Similarly, there are tools that let you just get a smart contract online. It's only when you want to go a little bit more custom is when you actually do need to learn to code. And that depends on the project. You know, if you want to make something that's very, if no one's ever made anything like this ever before, that's probably where you need to learn to code. Um, I would probably start with uh, the basics. So things like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, getting that kind of base understanding of how websites work, basically. Um, I know that smart contracts are not really websites, but having that kind of understanding of um, that interaction layer and that able that ability to, to make things, I think is just really important to that step, be able for that next step to go to smart contracts. So smart contracts use a lot of um, language that looks kind of similar to JavaScript, which is the interaction layer on websites. So there is a bit of familiarity between that kind of, if you know JavaScript well enough, you'll kind of understand how to do things like smart contracts going forwards. So I think that would generally be a good path. So, you know, we do a course on uh, Crypto and Web3, which is all about how to write your own smart contracts, how to interact with smart contracts as well, how to, to mint things and, you know, do things on a more custom level. But if you just want to make a smart contract, put some basic art on there, there are ways to do that without needing to learn to code. So I'm not a kind of proponent of saying you definitely need to code. Like there are people out there that say everyone in the world should, need, should learn to code. For me, I think it's only important if you actually need to do it. Learn the skills you need to learn to get where you need to be in your career. So for me, if you want to make the basics, just want to do a smart contract, there are tools to do that. If you want to do something custom, that's when you need to learn. So that's kind of where my border is on, you know, whether someone should learn to code or not. It's on whether they actually need those skills to do the projects you want to make. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rick, for joining us today and, and oh, sharing cool. um, all thanks. of this amazing information. I would encourage everyone to go check out the website. What is it? Supai.com. Supai.com. And, you know, check it out, check out the free course, let us know how it is, check out the paid course. And um, we're, we're looking forward to learning more about the program and the basic income uh, program that you have the initiative. I'm sure that it's going to get bigger and bigger from here. Thank you very much for having me on. All right. I'll see you next time. <laughs>